Hi, I'm Simon St. Lawrence, Senior Editor at O'Reilly Media Inc. I'm here today with Phil Didelitz. We're discussing configuration management at massive scale at Facebook and a lot of the creative challenges they've had moving from their old infrastructure to their new infrastructure. It's always an exciting jump. It is. So what kind of things made you think it was time to, to make that leap? What was CF Engine doing for you? So uh, this isn't the first time I've, I've uh, engineered a move away from CF Engine 2. Um, and specifically CF Engine 2, uh, it has many features, but at its core it's a file copy mechanism, mm -hmm. uh, which, which just limits how dynamic it can be. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a really large infrastructure and it's not homogenous, right? Like we have a lot of different kinds of servers right. that are doing different kinds of things. We run lots of experiments. Um, so, you know, just because you're a database server doesn't mean that all database servers are created equal. Uh, just because you're a web server doesn't mean all web servers are created equal. Right? So we have, we have all sorts of exceptions and all sorts of dynamic stuff within our environment. And we needed something that was just more granular than I copy a file, right? So the canonical example I always give is we had 151 copies of syscontrol.com. And you yes. know, trying to map which, like, what lines are in common, what settings are there, in which file, and why, and from who, and and it's just that was, that was a nightmare, right? We wanted a system where we would know here's the defaults, here's what here's what a Facebook system is, and then these people overrode these settings on these systems for these reasons, merge that all together, and write out that config in an appropriate way. Right. So you could track what was happening. You would be able to see the pieces have an actual flow to it and not right. just copy it. And also we can delegate the right bits and pieces to the right people, right? The DBAs know what, like how much shared memory MySQL needs. I don't know how much shared memory MySQL needs. Like, it's not your problem. It's not yeah. my problem, right? Like, so I want someone who knows that problem to be able to solve that problem and own that config. And I understand how syscontrols need to get laid out, what needs to change, you know, that we have to run syscontrol minus p when we write right. out a new file, like all of that stuff. That that's what my team's good at, right? And so, right. so, so why don't we build a system that manages that and gives the other people the ability to change the bits and pieces they care about on their systems? Right, and and do it in a coherent way. Right. It's just yes. So you moved to Ops Code Private Chef, or are moving to, or so, how is this? So we use to be clear, we use both Private Chef and Open Source Chef, okay. um, and that's a really important point. Um, we sat down with OpsCode mm -hmm. uh, when, when we felt that Chef was going to be what we wanted to build this new infrastructure on. Uh, and they had they were in the process of moving from the Ruby uh, server to, uh, to the Erlang server. Right. And uh, sort of the difference oftentimes between Private Chef and Open Source Chef server is, and there's only one client, but on the server side there's two, right. is that a lot of times Private Chef is the, 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 the testing ground for new features, right? Mm. So, if they're going to write some cool new feature, they give it to the paying customers first. Um, the, they guarantee an API that's consistent for across both so that there's only one client. Mm -hmm. uh, and then features will often merge back into Open Source Chef, and they're very good at that. Um, we needed the performance that were, they were getting in this new API server they were writing. And so in Hosted Chef, they'd hit all these scalability issues, and right. they'd written the Erlang version and moved the three, uh, the three most hit endpoints to the Erlang server. Okay. Uh, and then the plan was to keep moving that, and then once that that once that migration had been done in Private Chef and Hosted Chef, uh, figure out where in the roadmap that would go into Open Source Chef. And so we sit down, and, and, and we were like, look, we need these performance for improvements, and in fact, we're going to need more. We're going to need all of those endpoints. We just are. Right. Um, and also, I don't want to go and talk about something that people have to buy money for, like pay money for, right? right? right. We want to talk about something that the entire community has access to. So I'm willing to pay for Private Chef. I want to give back to Opscode. I think they're a great company. Right. Also, this has to get into Open Source Chef, and it has to go be on a timeline that you guys want, like that we're all comfortable talking about it on. Right. So we sat down and we had that conversation, mm -hmm. and they were really open and they were really um, receptive to that. And they finished the rewrite onto Earth Chef, and they merged into Open Source and Private Chef at roughly at the same time, and that's where the Open Source Chef Eleven server comes ah, from. Okay. And uh, so, so to get that was a long explanation, but to get no, back to the question you actually asked, right. we have some servers that run Open Source Chef, some servers that run Private Chef. Uh, both of them scale to Facebook uh, Size, Facebook scale. Yeah. We have the license for Private Chef because we want early access to features, and also because we heavily depend on Private Chef for our testing infrastructure. Okay. Um, but for prod clusters, we run mm -hmm. some on, on Open Source Chef, and you totally can do it. Beautiful, beautiful. And were you also testing Chef itself as that process was going on? How did you? So <laughs> there are a lot of moving parts. How did how do we get there? Is that what you're yeah. asking? Yeah. Um, so we did. So in the really really early days, when we decided, hey, let's 
let's let's figure out how to like how to move off of Safe Engine 2. What what do we want to build on? Do we want to write our own thing? Do we want to look at it, what's out there? Do we have pri proprietary solutions, open source solutions? Uh, there was we're we're an open source company, so obviously the, the our, our preference was to go with an open source solution. Right. So looked at all the things out there, it's kind of first blush. Right. We narrowed it down to three things: Puppet, Chef, and Spine. Spine being uh, something that I co-wrote at uh, when I was a Ticketmaster. There's a couple oh, okay. of us that, that wrote and open sourced that. Right. Uh, and so each one of I, I took two of my coworkers, mm -hmm. and each one we all designed a couple like tests that we thought were going to most stress these things in a Facebook environment. Beautiful. Uh, and then we each took the thing we thought would fail. So Beautiful. I thought Chef would fail, and I took it. Uh, I gave Spine to somebody else because I knew well, like, obviously I was going to be you know it was going to be easy for me to do that and give uh, Puppet to another guy. And each one of us went off in a corner, and we we tried to implement two things uh, that we thought would be difficult. And we came back, and, we, and it was our job to sell that tool. And cool. we came back, and and everyone sort of looked at Chef and felt that that it was going to be flexible enough for us to build what we wanted. Mm -hmm. And I think actually any one of those tools could have done it, okay. um, but Chef was 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 more flexible and it can be a lot easier to bend to, to our will. Right. So we did that, uh, and then it was like, okay, well now what do we do? <laughs> so we had all those conversations yes. I, I, I talked about with private Chef, public uh, open source Chef, blah, blah, blah. Skip ahead. Right. Okay, cool. Now we know what we want to build on. Now it's time to write cookbooks and time to figure out to write all this infrastructure. Right. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to provide these APIs. We wanted everyone to be able to manage infrastructure based on just assigning entries into hashes or arrays. That was wow. the core of it right. what we really wanted to happen. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, well, how do we, we... We knew that we felt that the chef model would best lend itself to that. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, okay, now we've got to write do, we started doing all this. So we wrote, we wrote a syscontrol cookbook. We wrote a result.conf cookbook. We, wrote a, we started writing right. all this. And it took about a year to get that foundation laid. Okay. Uh, and once we did that, we started taking... We took our most... Probably one of our most complicated tiers. Okay, starting with web parts. servers. Yeah, um, and and we started trying to make that work on this new infrastructure. And the right. idea was is that most people were going to have to move their own stuff. But before we could convince anyone to move their own tiers, we had to show that it was going to scale, it was going to be the right solution, and it was going to work. So right. we took the web servers, which are our biggest tier, right. and our team did that. And we got we it took a, took another six months or so to get all that converted. Uh, once we did, we moved to a box, then a rack, and then several racks, and then a cluster, and so on and so forth. Right. And once we had all the web servers done, we we're like, "Cool, this works." Right. That took many months. Yes. And then it was like, "Okay, well, now what do we do?" And then the next step was, "Okay, we need classes, we need tools, we need documentation." And we did all that, and then we started. We literally created a task for every single person in the company who owned a tier, and said, "Wow, you need to start moving your stuff." Um, so we're about sixty percent moved at this point. Okay, good. Um, we will probably be done. Uh, late Q1. Okay. Um, and yeah. And then the scary part. So what comes after? I mean, you're going to convert everything. What what kinds of things are you looking forward to in you know, hopefully in future releases of Chef and not a complete starting over or anything. But what what would you like to see in open source infrastructure next? So, so uh, well, so last thing that's two questions. You, Sorry, what do I want yeah. to see in Chef and what do I want to see in open source infrastructure? In uh, Chef. We in the Chef 10 client, we actually did some crazy things okay. to work yep. around features that were not yet there. Okay. Uh, and, and in order to do that, we end, like kind of things that we would have that, that ended up in Chef 11. Mm -hmm. But to do that on Chef 10, we did crazy hacks. Right. And so moving to Chef 11 now, the client right. is fairly fairly problematic for us. Um, okay. So we're on Chef 11 server everywhere. Um, but the client is you have to where the API chain, right? Yeah. So uh, once everyone is moved, we will then take on the project of, OK, now how do we take all these configs and make them work in Chef 11 the way we okay. want them to? And then how do we utilize the features that Chef 11 gives us? Mostly uh, attributes happening in run list order, uh, the mm -hmm. change in the precedence model, all of that stuff that changes. But right. if we just dropped in Chef 11 client, all our stuff would break. Right. Um, <laughs> and once we make that migration, we can actually drop a lot of the hacks that we've added. Um, and again, a lot of that comes from our feedback to them. Right. Um, we sat with Adam Jacob in our office and was like, this doesn't work. OK, how do we hack around that? This doesn't work. OK, how do we hack around that? And honestly, that's why we picked Chef, is because it's easy to hack around right. things in the tool that we didn't like or that we needed that weren't there. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the what's coming in Chef for us. Um, I think what I think in the, the, the larger question there of, of what do I want to see in the technology community and right. the open source community. Uh, so one of the things I talk about in my talk is uh, this concept of idempotent systems as opposed to idempotent records. 
Okay. Uh, so we configuration management systems typically manage a user, a cron job, a syscontrol entry. Right. And so you have this problem where you get stale entries. If you delete mm. that, the rule that says go create this user from your from your repo, then that then the, your system doesn't know to manage it, so it just gets right. stale. So you either have to have stale stuff, or you end up saying, hey, you need to, you leave an entry in there that says, hey, delete this, and then you have croft, and that and right. sucks, right? right? So we ended up going a very different way. We don't use a lot of the internal resources, and we actually use templates and, and hashes okay. uh, wherever we can to provide those data APIs I talked about, um, which flies in the face of what most community cookbooks are doing. Right. And so we're trying to start this conversation of like, OK, we think this is the right way of doing things. We think this is beneficial to anyone who has, whether it's five servers or 500,000 servers, it doesn't matter. I right. think this is just a generally useful way of doing things. How do we merge those two paths? How do we interact with the community better and get them on that path uh, where it makes sense and have that conversation and when does it make sense and when does it not make sense um, so that we can share more and more of our code. Um, so we've, we've shared a ton of our utilities open source. Right. We're not sharing cookbooks at this point um, because there's there's not a clear way on how to how to do that, and we right. want to have that we want to have that conversation and come up with ways that we can actually share more and more of our code. Um, and so I think that conversation, um, right? I think that's part of the I hate terms, but DevOps movement. Right, and, right. It's really, okay. really hate terms, but 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 <laughs> I think that where that movement is 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 beneficial is that people are actually starting to talk about what's the crux of our infrastructure. How do we manage our infrastructure? What does infrastructure as code mean? Right. How do you scale infrastructure? Um, and and I think that that's I think that that's where that movement's actually really helpful. Um, I think I think people get caught up in well, I'm I'm not a system anymore. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a systems yeah. engineer. I'm a DevOps guy. And right and like at the end of the day, we all need to write code. And if you can't write code, you're gonna get left behind. And like right. that's a totally useful concept. But I don't think you need I I, I don't think the label's what's important. I think what's right. important is that. We're sharing bodies of code, and that system engineering or system man or whatever you want to call it is maturing as an industry, and starting to leverage all the things that software development has been leveraging for the last right. twenty years. And like, we're, at, we're there's actually an industry now. It's not this black art that like right. you know the fat bearded dude in the corner can do. It's like a thing that we can actually share and talk about as an industry. And I think that that's right. It's in its infancy, infancy, but I think that it's. I think that's what's going to be exciting in the next two to five years. So, so sharing the code is getting the conversation started. Right. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much. I hope we'll see you again soon. Of and uh, good luck with this massive transition. Thank you so much. Thank you.